Hello, thank you for joining us for our Facebook Live discussion. As many of you know, February is Heart Month, and we're joined today by Dr. William Whitmer, interventional cardiologist with Aurora Bay Care Cardiology, to discuss your heart and your health. Thanks for talking to us today, Dr. Whitmer. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me. I hope everyone is staying warm out there. It's been incredibly cold. It is incredibly cold. Uh, before we get started, I do want to ensure everyone that Dr. Whitmer and myself are joined today from separate locations, so we are being safe. We hope all of you are doing the same as well. Uh, if you do have questions about heart health or heart disease, please feel free to ask them in the comments below. Uh, we'll do our best to answer your questions today in real time. If we run out of time before the broadcast has finished, please um, don't worry. We'll respond to those online after we conclude today's broadcast as well. So why don't we go ahead and get started. I want to start with just Heart Month in general. Dr. Whitmer, this is your time of year. Tell us a little bit about Heart Month and the importance of recognizing um, an event like this. So uh, Heart Month to us, obviously, is very important. I did a little research last night to find out when it originated. And actually, um, this is the 58th anniversary of Heart Month. Um, Lyndon, B., uh, Lyndon B. Johnson proclaimed Heart Month to be February every year in 1963. Um, and he proclaimed that this was a time to raise the awareness of heart disease across the country uh, as the biggest killer and to help improve uh, prevention, treatment, and diagnosis of the disease. So what does that mean today? Um, today, uh, we still are trying to spread the message that heart disease is the number one killer among women and men. And uh, in, in, in doing that, hoping to have two things happen. One, to encourage people to improve their lifestyles, uh, make healthy lifestyle habit changes, to reduce their risk of having heart disease in the future and reduce their risk of death and have a more uh, a flourishing life. And also number two, to uh, help people understand the symptoms of heart disease and pay attention to those so they can go uh, get diagnosed and treated. Absolutely, and that's part of our goal here today as well. So hoping we can accomplish some of that. Um, I think when most people think of heart disease, they think of heart attack. Um, but heart disease can really mean a multitude of things. Can, can you elaborate on maybe some of those other conditions that kind of fall under that umbrella? Sure, so you're absolutely right, Alicia. Uh, heart disease includes a huge gamut of different illnesses. And um, we kind of uh, uh, break those down into three categories. And you think of what the heart does, the heart takes blood and pumps it to the lungs so that it can be filled with oxygen. And then it receives that blood and then pumps that oxygenated blood to the whole body to give the body the nutrients and oxygen it needs. So um, it's like any other mechanical pump. It has kind of three components, electricity, plumbing, and uh, you know mechanical components. Um, so the plumbing, uh, we consider the blood supply to the heart, which is the arteries that feed the heart. Like you said, this is the most common heart disease. And the one most people think of is blockages in the arteries that feed the heart or coronary artery disease. Those are the things that cause heart attacks and can lead to heart damage and heart failure. But there are other uh, conditions. Uh, another big uh, subcategory is the electricity of the heart. So that deals with rhythm problems of the heart. Um, essentially, they can be broken down into the heart going too fast or going too slow. And often that leads to the placement of a pacemaker or defibrillator device. Then the third category um, is all the mechanics of the pump, the things that make the, the, the fluid move and keep the fluid moving in the right direction. So those are things like the valves in the heart, which can have disease if the valves don't open all the way or if they leak too much, that can cause trouble. Um, and then also disease of the intrinsic muscle of the heart that can cause the muscle not to function well. So it's basically uh, electricity of the heart, the blood supply to the heart or, or blockages in the arteries that feed the heart uh, causing heart attacks or structural heart disease, which is um, primarily valvular heart disease um, or uh, intrinsic muscle disease. Right. So there's really a whole gamut of sort of conditions that fall under this umbrella. You mentioned right. heart disease being the number one killer of both men and women in the United States, but I want to quantify those numbers just a little bit more how common of a problem is heart disease for those of us living here in the U.S.? So simply put, like we both said, the heart disease is the number one killer of men and women uh, across, across pretty much all demographics. Um, 
has a, a prevalence about 140 million people at any point in time in the United States have heart disease. So that's about 48% of the population. Um, and there are about 700,000 deaths from heart disease in the US every year. So to put that in perspective, especially with COVID, people are hearing the numbers every day about COVID. Um, we're coming up on a year of COVID now and it's eking up to probably about 500,000 deaths in the US will be attributed to COVID. And there are uh, in this same year, 700,000 deaths from heart disease. So we could think of heart disease as a yearly pandemic in a way. Yeah, absolutely. We did have one question come in and I wanna to get to that. Ellen is wondering if PAC is considered heart disease. PAC, so that can stand for premature atrial contraction. I'm assuming that's what it means. Um, so that is a situation that's a part of the electricity of the heart where you get an early heartbeat that comes uh, from the upper chambers of the heart and, and some focus of cells in the upper chambers of the heart, the atria uh, beats before it's supposed to and causes the whole heart to beat a little early. Um, they can sometimes uh, cause symptoms, sometimes not. In fact, it's very normal to have them. Everyone should have PACs occasionally, but some people for whatever reason start to feel them and they can you can feel them as a palpitation or a funny heartbeat uh, or taking your breath away for a second. If they happen many, many, many in a row, you know, 30, 40, 50 in a row, we call that SVT or supraventricular tachycardia. And that often is treated with medications or other procedures like ablation. Excellent. Thank you for, for answering that. And I want to get back to um, just quantifying the problem of heart disease here in the U.S. You had briefly mentioned it, but this is across all demographics, or is there one demographic that's maybe more affected by heart disease than another? Um, there really isn't. Uh, pretty much across most demographics, heart disease causes a quarter of all deaths or one in four deaths. M maybe uh, American uh, Native Americans have a little bit lower incidence than the other demographics uh, a bit, but otherwise it's, it's pretty uniform. Excellent. I want to talk about some of those primary risk factors that you mentioned. Um, are there risk factors that, that can kind of make the problem worse in, other, in, in some individuals? What are the risk factors of heart disease? So there, um, there are many minor risk factors, but five major risk factors are the FAB5. And those are a family history of heart disease, uh, and that's defined as a direct relative um, who has a uh, heart attack before the age of 55 uh, or heart disease before the age of 55. Two is smoking. Uh, smoking increases the risk of heart disease by easily 50% or more, plus causing a lot of other bad things. Um, then there's high blood pressure or hypertension uh, can increase the risk of heart disease. Uh, next is high cholesterol or hyperlipidemia can increase the risk. Um, and then the last one is diabetes, um, which will increase your risk of heart disease. Yeah, and, and we're gonna get into some of those risk factors and, and maybe some of how to mitigate some of that uh, later on in our discussion, but you brought it up briefly and I, and I don't think that we can have this conversation today without mentioning it. Um, but can you talk a little bit about the role that COVID-19 plays in our heart health and, and maybe some of the numbers that are coming out of, of this recent pandemic? Sure. So um, first, I think the most important message to get out there about COVID and the heart is that if you have any symptoms suggestive of heart disease, you should not stay home and wait until COVID's over or wait uh, uh, till it's safer to come safer to come to the hospital. Um, we're seeing way too many people come in in the last year to the hospital late with heart disease when they've already had so much heart damage that we can't help them as much as we could if they came in right away. In fact, some come in actually dying. Uh, and that's the case all across the country. Uh, it's certainly a common um, thought in, uh, to, for people to have, well, it's dangerous to go to the hospital. But actually, the hospital is one of the safest places to go as far as COVID is concerned. Uh, the patients there are tested, and if they're positive, they're isolated very thoroughly and everyone's following regulations to prevent spread. Um, so urge you, urge you, urge you, do not stay home with symptoms because of COVID. Uh, come in and get checked out. That's the main message. To answer your question directly, uh, COVID can affect the heart. Um, and we're learning about this. So we may not really fully understand it for several years, but um, we've uh, the most recent studies show that most of the heart trouble with COVID is indirect damage, meaning that uh, when you have serious COVID infection, you have a diffuse uh, inflammatory response throughout the body, um, which can cause lack of oxygen supply to the heart, which can cause damage, and also can cause blood clotting in the tiny vessels of the heart, which can cause damage. 
Um, so certainly if you already have heart disease and then you get COVID, you have a little bit increased risk of having trouble because your heart's already um, not at its optimum uh, uh, capacity and could be hurt more easily. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and it gets to those risk factors that you had mentioned as well. So we'll talk about that in just a moment. Um, we have another question that came in from Karen, and we're going to talk about this a little bit um, later as well. Um, she's asking about the use of fish oil or other types of things in relation to your diet and heart and your heart and things like that. So could you elaborate on, on that? And I know we'll touch on it a little bit later in this conversation too, but. Sure. So fish oil is kind of in that category. I look at as uh, supplements or micronutrients. Um, Unfortunately, a lot of the studies are all, most of the studies on micronutrients and, and fish oil and vitamin E and those types of things have not shown much promise in heart disease. Fish oil is a little bit of an exception in the sense that if you have high triglycerides, um, we sometimes put people on fish oil and that can help treat that condition. In addition, if you're not eating fish regularly, it's not a bad idea to take supplements with fish oil. We believe it may be helpful. But there aren't any solid studies that really show a huge benefit of taking fish oil every day as far as reducing risk. Um, but it's not a bad thing. Um, there are, uh, was some fear out there for a while that fish oil would increase your risk of bleeding. And uh, some recent studies have shown that that's really not the case. Um, so in summary, fish oil is safe. I think uh, in most cases, uh, certainly should check every medicine you take with your physician who knows you better or your primary care provider. But um, in most cases, very safe, not harmful, but also not as helpful as we had hoped it would be. Great. Thank you for that. If you're just joining us, I'm here today with Dr. William Whitmer, an interventional cardiologist with Aurora Bay Care Cardiology in Green Bay, Wisconsin. Uh, we're discussing heart health. Uh, if you do have questions about your heart health or heart disease, please feel free to ask them in the comments below. We're going to do our best today to answer those questions in real time as we move through our conversation. So we've just gone over some of those risk factors of heart disease, and you mentioned the FAB5. Um, we'll repeat those again. You mentioned high blood pressure, high cholesterol, physical inactivity, diabetes, obesity, smoking, family history, those kinds of things. All but one of those is, is something that we can pretty much control, correct? Right. Certainly. Uh, and that's a good point to make and hit home. Um, certainly family history, you can't change. You can't choose your parents, as you know. Um, but you can do a lot of things to reduce your risk, even if you have a strong family history of heart disease. Um, first off, smoking is an easy one. You know, stopping smoking should be a priority. If you are smoking, uh, that should be your number one priority because by stopping smoking, you'll get the biggest bang for your buck and reduction of risk of heart disease, reducing your risk of death and heart attack by 50%. So that'd be your first goal. If you're not smoking or have already stopped, then um, next up would be uh, high blood pressure. Um, uh, that certainly can be treated with medication, uh, but also exercise, diet, and weight loss can help improve blood pressure also. So that's something you can kind of control. Uh, cholesterol, similarly, you can lower your cholesterol with diet and exercise. And also there are many medications we can give that can lower cholesterol further if needed. Um, uh, so that leaves um, diabetes. There are two types of diabetes, um, type 1 and type 2. So type 1 is a lack of insulin production. Uh, and certainly uh, diabetes of any type should be treated and can be treated and treating it will reduce your risk. Type one uh, is again, a lack of insulin production. Type two diabetes, it very interestingly, uh, can sometimes be cured. Uh, and that is with exercise and diet. Type two diabetes is not so much a problem with insulin underproduction, it's a problem with insulin resistance, where your cells are resistant to the action of insulin to bring glucose into the cells, so your glucose levels rise. And diet, exercise, and weight loss can improve that tremendously, and, um, uh, and also fasting can help uh, that also. So that's a very treatable disease, certainly, and sometimes curable. Interesting. And, and The basic message, you know, uh, you can make it simple by saying, you know, you can reduce all your risk factors except family history by improving your diet and exercise, you know, um, right. those treat, treat them all. Right. And we'll get into those. I know you have a few tips for us um, later on in our conversation as well. But part of this is education, right, and understanding what those risk factors are. So if I am a person who might be considered at a higher risk or have higher risk of some of these 
Um, what should I be looking for as far as symptoms? How do symptoms of heart disease present themselves sometimes? So the, the symptoms of heart disease uh, can be very variable. And let's start with the symptoms of a heart attack or, or blockages in the arteries that feed the heart. Um, they can vary from the most severe crushing chest pain you can imagine um, to the tiniest bit of discomfort you can imagine. I have one patient who described his chest discomfort as an, a huge elephant sitting on his chest and another patient who described it literally told me it felt like a mouse just crawled on top of his chest and sat down. So it can range from an elephant to a mouse. The other thing that's important to know is it doesn't always have to be in the chest or on the left side of the chest. Location in the chest really has no significance. It can be anywhere in the chest. It can be in the upper abdomen. It can be in the arm, um, in the neck, uh, uh, sometimes in the teeth. Some people think they're having a toothache and it's actually pain from a heart attack. So really any new discomfort that's above the waist, uh, back, chest, arm, neck, anywhere in there. Um, now, putting aside heart attacks, the next uh, group of symptoms that can uh, indicate heart disease would be um, shortness of breath uh, or decreased exercise tolerance. Um, then the electrical uh, problems can often present with people feeling lightheaded, like they're gonna pass out or, or actually passing out or feeling palpitations or your heart racing. Another symptom of, say, heart failure would be swelling in the, in the legs. So shortness of breath, um, new swelling or weight gain, decreased exercise tolerance, any type of new discomfort above the waist, um, palpitations are passing out. Yeah, and it's really, you had mentioned it just briefly too, that, that these symptoms can vary by person to person and even men to women, right? Yes, very much so, yeah. So um, I mean, we could talk about women, you know, that's a whole... Uh, different and important topic. Um, women really, uh, studies have shown, have the same symptoms of men, but the issue with women that um, we're all responsible for is that not only men, but women and healthcare providers frequently will ignore women's symptoms of heart disease and think they're from something else rather than mm -hmm. from a heart attack. So that's the main issue. In fact, um, a study once showed that 50% uh, of women who come on in with classic symptoms of heart, heart, heart attack are sent home. Um, whereas, you know, most, most men are admitted with those symptoms. So it's a matter of education, both of the population and of, of uh, healthcare providers to be more sensitive to symptoms of heart disease in, in women that they uh, often will represent heart disease and not something else. Right, right. And I think women themselves, and just speaking from personal experience, I would explain it away as maybe something else too. So it's a good that's what heart month is for, so that we can all uh, re-educate ourselves on, on some of these symptoms for sure. Right. Um, how important, and you had talked about this briefly too, but how important is time in relation to heart disease and issues like these? If you are experiencing symptoms, do we wait until the next morning or do we recognize it? And how important is that? So if you are having a heart attack, time is crucially important. The longer you wait to get to the hospital, the more likely you, you have of dying and of having permanent heart damage. So the sooner you can get to the uh, hospital, uh, the better we can help you and the less likely you'll have of permanent damage to the heart and disability and death. Um, so, you know, the, the symptoms um, that would prompt you to go immediately to the emergency room, you know, there are kind of two sets of symptoms. One would be symptoms that you would want to pay right attention to right away and call 911 and get to the emergency room immediately. And the other set is are, are symptoms that you could maybe wait and have an appointment with your doctor to see. And in group one, to call 911 for would be any new discomfort. And again, like we discussed, it doesn't have to be severe uh, above the waist that's new uh, and isn't going away after 10, 15 minutes, you should be getting to the hospital because that could be a sign of a heart attack that could be uh, you know, cured basically. So the the other symptom that should bring you to the hospital would be shortness of breath at rest. If you're just sitting there and very short of breath, that's a reason to go to the hospital. Or if you're having feelings like you're going to pass out uh, or have passed out, you know, those those are reasons to go right away. On the other hand, if you're having symptoms that are kind of gradually progressing or new and in your uh, things like a decrease in exercise tolerance where you could walk you know, 10 minutes on the treadmill and now at eight minutes you get more shorter breath and have to stop. Um, or, or uh, you know, um, you have a little bit of chest discomfort while you're exerting yourself, it goes right away when you rest. 
those are things you could uh, uh, call your doctor about and get seen you know, within a week or something like that. Okay. But if you have any questions about which way to go, always call your healthcare provider. They all have 24 seven lines to call and you can speak with a healthcare provider and, and ask questions. You know, it's better to be safe than sorry for sure. Absolutely. Yeah, and that was and that was going to be my next uh, question. And, and it may seem obvious, but if a person is experiencing any of these symptoms, your recommendation is just call. Just yes, for sure. Yeah, if you have any question, don't hesitate. Um, ask, and it's better to ask than not to know. Absolutely. Well, this is really great information. If you're just joining us, I'm here today with Dr. William Whitmer, an interventional cardiologist with Aurora Bank Care cardiology here in Green Bay, Wisconsin. We're discussing heart disease in your health. I want to remind everyone that we are taking questions today, so please feel free to ask those in the comments here below. Uh, Dr. Whitmer will try to answer those questions in real time. I am seeing a few more questions come in, and we're going to get to that in this next section, so um, more specifically related to diet. Um, you've already talked about heart health as something that uh, we can largely control, and so I want to um, end our discussion today with some tips from you. I know that you live a very heart healthy lifestyle, obviously, and we want to talk a little bit about that and, and some tips that we can share with our viewers today as well. So um, education being a huge component of this heart health, in addition to knowing your risk factors, um, you know, what do you recommend as far as individuals rec recognizing these risk factors, but also knowing like their numbers and those kinds of things themselves? Well, um, you know, what that really involves is seeing your healthcare provider, which everyone should do by age 20 for sure, to get your cholesterol checked and uh, screen for diabetes and check your blood pressure. And then, you know, at least every five years after that, um, and everyone should have a primary care provider for caring for all their other parts of their body also, not just the heart. But as far as the heart's concerned, everyone should definitely have their cholesterol and checked and screened for hypertension and diabetes at least by age 20 and, and, and every five years after. Um, because treating those uh, risk factors can really reduce your risk quite a lot. When you say start a cholesterol medicine um, to lower your cholesterol, you, you don't, uh, you're not expecting immediate effect, although there may be a little bit of immediate effect. You're really doing it for 10, 20 years down the line. When you, uh, you know, the cholesterol plaques start uh, when we're very young, they learned that in the Vietnam War from the autopsies that 18, 19 year old men were having fatty streaks in their arteries already. And that's uh, kind of when this LBG J uh, proclamation came about heart month, they realized how prevalent it was and how early it started. So you're fighting a disease that started when you were very young. So it, it doesn't reverse immediately. It takes time. So you want to treat those risk factors the earlier, the better, you know, to get the biggest effect. So seeing your doctor regularly, your prime, primary or healthcare provider regularly is very important. Right, and you're and you're talking about the primary care um, physician kind of playing a, a role in that in those tests. One of the questions that we got coming in um, even before our discussion today um, is: there a simple test to see if your carotid artery is blocked? I know we've been hearing things about heart tests and those kind of things that people can go and get. What do you what do you say about those? Well, the the carotid arteries are the arteries in the neck that feed uh, the brain with blood, and if they have blockages, they can uh, eventually lead to stroke. Um, so they are very important to follow. Um, we, uh, when you're in um, your healthcare provider's office, they do listen to those to listen for abnormal noises that would suggest a blockage. And then if they do hear that, oftentimes then we get the next step, which is an ultrasound of the carotid arteries, which is a painless non-invasive invasive test where they take a probe with gel and rub it on the neck and they can tell if there are blockages there or not. Um, there are many health screening uh, uh, providers that go around the country you may see at church events and things like that that kind of do screening where they'll look at the arteries in the neck and look at the abdomen for an aneurysm with that ultrasound and check your blood pressure. Um, you know, I, I don't have any bad feelings about those at all. I think they're very good. Oftentimes you can get a really good deal and a really good price on those or they're sometimes free. Um, but if those tests are abnormal, then we need to go on to the more uh, uh, surefire tests that we have in the hospital and get, get the, the final information. Um, so if those tests are normal, they're usually very reliable, but if they're abnormal, then you want to get to a, a, a healthcare provider to get further evaluated. So you can look at the arteries in the neck for blockages with an ultrasound. We don't do that on everyone, but if we suspect disease there, then we do. Great. 
The, the next big one, and I know this is, is one that kind of gets to us all because we all know inherently that it's good for us, and that's diet and exercise. You mentioned it before, that being um, a big component of, of even reducing most of those risk factors. Um, I want to talk about that because it doesn't mean necessarily running a marathon or you know doing things like that, but can you talk about, let's start with exercise uh, and, and what that actually means, just you know not living a sedentary lifestyle. Right, so that's that's a great point, and it's not oftentimes not easy, uh, but it's it's important to try to make it easier to to make it more palatable to do. I had a patient just last week. He looked at me and he said, "Doc, is is there any pill you can give me that will make me want to exercise and eat?" Right? I said, "Sir, if I had that pill, I'd be sitting in the Caribbean right now with a little umbrella drink." Absolutely. Anyway, you have to motivate yourself in some way. Um, but as far as exercise is concerned, um, any exercise is good exercise. And one of the best things to do is to walk. Walking can be extremely beneficial. You don't have to walk fast. You can just walk at a regular pace. The goal is to move without stopping for at least 20 minutes and ideally up to 40 minutes at a time. You know, you, meaning you get a great benefit at 20 minutes. The benefit increases and increases the more you do it up to 40 minutes. After 40 minutes, the benefit gets better, but it's not a, as huge of a uh, steep a curve. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, try to develop a habit where you, you know, every morning get out and walk or walk on the treadmill for a short period of time. And when you start, if you haven't been doing it for a while, make it easy. You know, say, okay, after I brush my teeth this morning, I'm getting on a treadmill. Um, I'm going to put my sneakers on and get on the treadmill for one minute and just do that. And then, you know, in a couple of days later or the next day, say it's going to be two minutes and then gradually build up. That's one way to kind of uh, make it easier and uh, get after it. Um, the other thing you can do is to um, reward yourself, meaning, you know, keep a calendar. And if you do it for a whole week, do something nice for yourself that you wouldn't otherwise do. Get a special um, coffee drink at Starbucks or whatever it would be. Think of something like that. Um, one other trick that is common is to say, uh, get addicted to a Netflix series and say, okay, I can only watch this while I'm on the treadmill or at least the first half while I'm on the treadmill and, and those kind of things to make it fun and attractive to do. Other things you can do to help uh, motivate you is to get friends uh, who are in the same mindset that want to exercise more and have them encourage you to keep uh, exercise and exercise together, you know, to, to make yourself feel accountable to keep going with it. So any exercise is a good exercise. Uh, walking is one of the best. Um, I have many patients who have dogs and that keeps them walking twice a day. And that's just such a great thing because they will want to get you out there and that forces you out twice a day, oftentimes to take a you know, 20, 30 minute walk. Um, if you want to be perfect about exercise, it's, it's doing aerobic activity, you know, walking, biking, treadmill. It doesn't have to be a fat, fast pace again for uh, 30, 40 minutes, five days a week. And then um, strength training is very healthy too. Uh, building muscle can help burn fat uh, and burn calories. Muscles are fat burning factories. So any kind of uh, uh, light weight lifting to build muscle and bone is very helpful. And then the third category is yoga or stretching has been shown to be extremely beneficial um, for uh, uh, staying in shape and burning calories, but also for maintaining um, balance as we age increasing lung capacity and, and, and helping to treat blood pressure. Absolutely. We had a question come in from Diane while you were talking there. Um, wanted to know, and I think you mentioned it, um, that just any movement is good movement, but she's wondering if it's still as beneficial if you break up that 40 minutes and do two times of 20 minutes or, or vice versa. Um, two times of 20 minutes is better than one time. Um, <laughs> I, I think it's probably pretty similar, you know, um, I think that, that that would be equivalent for sure. Yeah. Excellent. And the next one I want to get to, and then we had a couple of questions come in regarding diet as well. Um, diet is something we all know. We all know what we should be eating. Um, we all have those temptations, as you mentioned. So um, are there a couple of high impact things that you can recommend um, as far as people and their diet uh, that we should focus on? So, um, just to just take a step back and talk about diet because um but what diet is best because it, it it's kind of becoming clear the more time goes on that there is a best diet you know it's people have been struggling with that for a long time uh, and again any diet that works for you 
and you can stick to is better than any other diet. That's the first message. So if you have a diet that you like and you're sticking to and you're not um, aborting after you know a year, then that's that's a great one for you. But if you want to pick the best diet, it's it's a Mediterranean diet. Always comes up in the studies as the best one. Um, and more recently, um, what's called the PESCO Mediterranean diet has been found to be the best. And each actually, it's been shown to be better as far as reducing the risk of death than just a pure vegetarian diet. This was the first study to show that there was one diet that was actually better than vegetarian for prolonging life and for health. So what is a Mediterranean diet to begin with? If you think about a food pyramid where the things at the bottom are the things you eat a lot of or as much as you want of and the things at the top you limit. Um, at the bottom of the Mediterranean diet is extra virgin olive oil, which has been shown over and over again to be incredibly healthy um, associated with prolonged life. Pour it on your vegetables, drink it if you like it, uh, cook, be, make it your primary cooking oil. Um, in that same lower level is fruits and vegetables, you know, up to four to five servings a day. All the plants, um, nuts of any kind, uh, avocados, all the legumes and those kinds of things. On the next level up, um, ideally uh, the protein from meat should be, uh, you know, and it can't always be, but ideally would be fish and seafood um, and not fried, uh, uh, obviously, because fried food is, is not uh, as healthy for us. So fish and seafood, um, a fair amount of that. And the next level up would be milk and dairy products and yogurt, which are healthy and have uh, been shown in some studies to reduce the risk of diabetes and chicken and, and uh, turkey and fowl would be in that level also. At the very top, the thing you eat the least of would of course be, as everyone knows, red meat, uh, beef and uh, pork, which is not off the list. It's just that, you know, we should probably try to limit that to one to two, two times a week if we can. Um, one, uh, uh, just in that whole course of things, there are a lot of things to talk about with diet. Um, bad things, you know, what's bad, what's good. Um, certainly, Soda is bad, you know, getting off of soda can help a lot. And that includes diet soda. Diet soda studies have shown that actually drinking diet soda will increase your weight and cause you to gain weight or be associated with weight gain and increase cardiovascular disease. I have one patient who did not change his diet at all, stopped drinking diet soda and lost 15, 20 pounds. So okay, I'm not sure I can explain that, but it has been shown over and over again. Um, the other thing that's really on the bad side is trans fats, you may hear that, trans fats. So trans fats were invented to help danishes and pastries and donuts last longer on the shelf um, because they don't deteriorate as fast, they're solid at room temperature. Um, those things are also in fried fast foods. Mm -hmm. um, if you're looking at the ingredients, if you see the term partially hydrogenated, that's the red flag that means trans fat. So those are things to cut out. Um, one of the things that, um, I found that the Mediterraneans do that's that's very interesting and, and might be a helpful thing for people to do uh, to eat better is uh, to have a, a concoction called sofrito around. So sofrito is a uh, simmered combination of onions, garlic, tomatoes, um, red peppers, and then herbs and spices. And they simmer that for three, four hours, and then they put it in a jar in the refrigerator and they pour it over everything. They put it over vegetables. You can eat it plain and it kind of fills you up. Um, there's extra virgin olive oil in there too. I don't know if I said that. So that's uh, one kind of tip. Um, overall, um, one other thing that I found to be very helpful uh, is to keep the bad food out of the house. You know, if it's not accessible. It's less likely to be eaten. I mean, I'm a, I'm a sucker for chocolate. And if there's Oreos in the house or chocolate cake or chocolate chip cookies, and it gets to be nine, 10 o'clock when it's been shown that your executive function, your brain frontal lobe function is much worse at inhibiting bad behavior, um, you know, I'll just eat them up, you know, uh, and if they're not in the house, I won't, you know, we have in our house what's called the naughty cupboard where we keep that stuff. We try to keep it empty, you know, as possible. That really helps a lot. Keep the chips, uh, cookies, ice cream out of the house. Um, that's one tip. The other is to find some healthy food on the list of healthy foods that you really like, you know, try to find something that you like and have it around all the time and everywhere you go, have it at work, in your car, um, at home, you know, whether it be a certain kind of nut uh, or um, a vegetable you like, carrots or celery or whatever, whatever it might be, you know, to have that available. So when you have urges, you always have something available that's healthy to eat to try to take the place of uh, the bad stuff. The other thing you can do when you're hungry and you shouldn't be eating like, uh, you know, at nighttime, 
uh, is to distract yourself by doing some exercise. Exercise can sometimes turn off your hunger. So just doing a few uh, uh, body weight exercises or some kind of exercise can sometimes help with that. Absolutely. Uh, we had a question come in from Diane. You had mentioned seafood. Um, what are the best types of fish to eat? Or is there is there a difference or a pro or con versus, I mean, you mentioned fried fish, <laughs> obviously here in Wisconsin, probably not the best choice, but could you talk a little bit about the types of fish? Yeah, I, I don't know a lot about the different types of fish and how much you know fish oil and healthy things they have in them. From what I've read, all fish is good and all seafood is healthy. Um, certainly frying is not the way to go and that can make it less healthy. Um, there, there have been a lot of worry about mercury and poisoning. Um, and the more and more time goes on, the more it seems that that really isn't as big a concern as we previously thought it was. Um, so uh, there are recommendations from the government on how much fish to eat. And it is important if you're uh, of um, uh, reproductive age and, and uh, you know, or you're a woman trying to get pregnant or you are pregnant to, to limit the amount of fish because of mercury, that is very important. But Beyond that, and we may be uh, over limiting it, um, but yeah, I guess I guess tuna. I would limit some because that seems to have a lot of uh, more more of the mercury in it. Um, but all fish and all seafood is is healthy, it really is. Great. Um, I do want to end, and I know especially with this year with the pandemic and all the restrictions and things that we've been working and dealing through, um, stress. Is, it, is, is something that, that everyone is dealing with. How big of a factor does stress play in our heart health and, and, and maybe some of our other things um, that are tips to manage that type of thing? So stress is associated with um, uh, development of heart disease and general body uh, illness. Um, it causes a lot of hormones to be released in the body, high cortisol levels, high adrenaline levels, which cause a situation in the body where um, there's more likely to be cellular injury and, and problems. And if you can somehow reverse that or keep it at bay, you can Im improve your health and uh, your mental state also. So if you have depression or anxiety, you know, get it treated, see uh, a care provider and get that treated. Um, things in the short term to help with stress or a sudden bout of anxiety, you know, are uh, exercise. Again, I keep coming back to that, but exercise can really uh, help a lot of things that can sometimes relieve stress. Um, meditation, uh, doing yoga. Uh, one thing I offer to my patients is the um, when you suddenly have some anxiety or stress you want to get rid of is to do um, deep breathing exercises. So that would be yoga breathing or uh, what I usually tell patients is to do the four by four method, which is a method that's taught to Navy SEALs actually for when they feel like they're overwhelmed with stress. And anxiety and that is a, a, a just a something that takes about two or three minutes where you take slow deep breaths in and out counting for four counting to four on each inhalation each exhalation and at the peak of each exhalation and in, inhalation concentrating just on your breathing so what you do is you start out by taking a deep breath blowing it out and then you lower your diaphragm to take in air and then you expand your chest that's the second component then you raise your shoulders a little bit to fully fill your lungs counting to four on the way in then you count to four holding the breath in then you breathe out in the exact opposite way lowering your shoulders first then collapsing your chest then pulling up your diaphragm all the way uh, counting four when you do that cold count to four when your diaphragm's fully up uh, and you're breathing all the way out uh, and then do it again for four times and you'll find if you do that four times that you really have forgotten about anything else but your breathing. It forces you to concentrate on your breathing, makes you forget about, at least for a few seconds, the whatever is causing the anxiety. But what it also does is release a lot of um, hormones and factors in the body, the lower blood pressure, lower heart rate, uh, relax the body, decrease cortisol levels, all these things that are healthy for you. So um, that's, that's a good habit to do, you know, twice a day too, to help with general health. But if that can also help anxiety quite a bit. Yeah, absolutely. That sounds that sounds fantastic. Uh, just taking advantage of that. We did have another question come in from Amanda. Um, does long-term steroid use uh, or can long-term steroid use cause heart disease? Um, 
That's a tough one to answer. Yeah, indirectly, it, it certainly can increase your risk because long-term steroid use can increase your blood sugar and, and push you over into diabetes, which is a, a risk factor for heart disease. Um, so it can be dangerous, but some people need long-term steroid use for treatment of another disease, and there's really no other option. Mm -hmm. um, I think that answers the question. So, I mean, obviously, in all these instances, talk to your healthcare provider <laughs> in some of those. Um, is there anything else that, that you want to add today, Dr. Whitmer, or perhaps can we recap maybe one or two very important takeaways from this discussion that, that people should remember? Um, the one thing I didn't really touch on completely is fasting. Fasting is uh, becoming more and more popular and has been shown to be very beneficial for weight loss and general health. So um, in that PESCO Mediterranean diet we talked about, it's also recommended to have at least a 12 to 16 hour window, ideally six, uh, 14 to 16 hour window where you're not eating every day. So this is flies in the face of what we said 20 years ago when everyone was saying, when you get up in the morning, have the biggest meal of your day and breakfast and eat small frequent meals all day long. That's what we were saying you know, 20 years ago. And it turns out that's probably the wrong thing to do. And um, evolutionarily, uh, and based on circadian rhythms, uh, we really need a time of a day that should be more than 12 hours where we're not eating anything except water. It's always important to stay hydrated. Um, uh, and, and if you have that period where you're not taking in calories, the body does a metabolic switch where it switches from using sugar as the main fuel to using fat and ketones. And uh, the whole body shifts in this mode of kind of repair, um, mitochondria repaired, cellular components are repaired, injured components are taken out of the body. Um, it's a very healthy time for the, for the body. Usually that's at night, hopefully. And that kind of goes along with sleeping, which does similar things to help the body recover and repair. But fasting has been shown to, uh, in animal studies to do amazing things. Now there aren't a ton of studies in humans yet, but in, in, in animals it's been shown to improve weight loss. In fact, there was one study done where they took uh, rats, of course, um, where they fed them a high fat meal uh, during the day and they fed, took two uh, sets of rats. One set they fed for eight hours a day, same amount of calories as another group, they fed those calories over the course of all 24 hours. And the ones they fed over 24 hours got obese. And the ones that uh, got the same number of calories over a limited amount of time did not. So wow. clearly something going on there where you can improve your health by having a period of time where you're not taking in the calories. During that time, though, it isn't very important to stay hydrated and you know drink water. Um, Everyone is dehydrated in the morning when they wake up. That's another thing that's commonly discussed. Um, and it's very important to drink water right when you wake up because being dehydrated can lead to uh, the blood being a little sticky and thick and promote heart attacks and blood clots in the body and all sorts of other bad things. And that may be one of the reasons why most heart attacks happen in the early hours of the morning because people are, are dehydrated. Interesting. Great. Well, and then, uh, what you asked me to have is kind of final closing statements. Absolutely. The main message, you know, would be one, see your primary care provider uh, to get screened for diabetes, high cholesterol and hypertension and get treated. Two, um, exercise doesn't have to be a lot, but try to do it every day. Or as the this, this, this smarty way to say that is only exercise on the days you eat. Um, and, then, <laughs> and three, eat more plants and Mediterranean type food. And, that's the, the major message. Absolutely. Those are wonderful takeaways. I appreciate you spending some time with us today, Dr. Whitmer. I think our viewers do too. Um, thank you all for your questions. Thank you all for watching. Uh, to be alerted about live content from Baycare Clinic, be sure to like us on Facebook and click on the bell icon below to subscribe. Again, Dr. William Whitmer is an interventional cardiologist with Aurora Baycare Cardiology here in Green Bay. He sees patients in Green Bay, Sturgeon Bay, and Kekona. And if you have additional questions, please ask them in the comments. As I mentioned, we'll continue to answer those online after today's live broadcast. Um, if you want to learn more about Baycare Clinic or Aurora Baycare Cardiology, visit us by clicking on the link in this post. Uh, you can also request an appointment by visiting baycare.net. Thank you, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, Alicia. Thank you, everyone.